Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining this webinar today on Understanding Behaviours and Fragile X Syndrome. My name is Liz Jewell and I work as the Family Support Counsellor with Fragile X Association Australia. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. If any of the content in this webinar triggers you emotionally and you feel in need of support, please contact either myself or Wendy. A special thank you to Zynerba Pharmaceuticals for the educational grants and making this three-part series of webinars with Marsha Braden possible. Dr. Marsha Braden is a clinical psychologist and a special educator living in the US. Marsha is respected for her work internationally and presented at numerous conferences and workshops with Fragile X Syndrome, Autism and other related disorders. In the first of this two-part series, Marsha will examine behavioural responses resulting from the neurobiology of Fragile X Syndrome, discuss why traditional behaviour intervention does not often bring success in reducing difficult behaviours, and present some strategies for successful supports. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Marsha. Hello everyone, it's so good to be back with the Australians and I think we've got some Kiwis listening in as well and maybe some other people from other areas in, in the world. I'm just so delighted to be here to talk to you about behavior with Fragile X individuals. We are focusing mostly on the males today, but we certainly will be available for later for the females. If any of you want to refer to the female webinar, please do, because we mentioned a lot of behaviors associated with the females in that particular webinar. So let's proceed. We have a lot to talk about today. I wanted to let you know that we're doing two parts to this lecture. The first part one will be today, and the second one will be later, as you can see on your calendars. The first part is to help us really define the phenotype. And the second part will address the in interventions and strategies. The phenotype is really important because it sort of gives us the foundation from which we exercise strategies and apply interventions. And this is important because those individuals with Fragile X truly do have and come to us with the neurobiology that causes us to really look at some of those strategies that are appropriate for those individuals. The intervention should build on those relative strengths and, and really attempt to address the weaknesses through our intervention. So part two will be strictly for the treatment and based on the information regarding the foundation that we've discussed today, you will then be looking at interventions that take into account the phenotype. We'll review those interventions and we'll that are, have been created and we'll build on those strengths and weaknesses. So let's begin talking about Fragile X as a genetic condition. And most of you, I'm sure in the audience know all about this, but I'm going to review it just briefly because it's important for us to factor in this genetic condition. It's different than others with other disabilities. And we wanna make sure that we really look at what's going on with these individuals with Fragile X. We know information from science about this gene and how it impacts the brain. This is not something that's just made up or sort of construed by parents that think their kids can do things that you don't see them doing at times. It's really based on science. And the brain is really acting and interacting with this genetic condition so that we have to account for it when we're looking at those behaviors that are presented. How does it affect the behavior? Well, you know, in, in so many cases, it, it affects individuals with Fragile X in a spectrum, sort of a spectrum of behavioral conditions. And we know this about those with Fragile X, don't we? We know that they come to us in various degrees of effectiveness. And so that's why we really call it a spectrum, just as we do the autism spectrum. There are individuals who are very affected, and then there are others that are hardly affected by the gene. And so again, we want to talk about that today. We want to talk about those challenges that, that persist in families and with peers and caregivers and teachers. And, and the big issue here, and the reason we're talking about this, is that behavior can really limit their interaction and their opportunities to be in society, in, in a wider range of society. And since there's no cure at this time, we always have our fingers crossed that something else is going to happen soon. 
we're going to keep focusing on these behaviors and the challenges of these behaviors. And I want to say that a lot of this lecture has come from an, a, a consensus document called Behavioral Challenges in Fragile X Syndrome. Full disclosure, I was one of the authors of that paper. I would recommend it highly. It does really go through a lot of the behaviors and the intervention strategies, sort of an overview of, of what we're talking about today. It's important, and you, those of you that have heard me speak before, sometimes you may have seen this slide. It's just, to me, such a good graphic indication of what it looks like for individuals with Fragile X to try to put things together. And their, their brain really is affected by the gene. And so what happens is there's an increased spine density, and that causes a high transmitter activation. It's like this antiquated fuse box. There's connections going every which way and nothing is making much sense. Now, this is nothing to do with, with, with their wishes to be this way. This just comes in on the gene. And of course, this is what they're, they're dealing with when they're trying to sort out their environment and make sense about what's going on around them. We want to rewire, we, we can't rewire the brain, but we want to rewire this fuse box, don't we? And we can, to some extent, make it look better and more organized by providing those supports related to those behavioral issues that they have. So today I'm gonna to share some of, of what's behind that particular support. And then in the next lecture, we'll talk about specific strategies. This is kind of what it looks like here. So this is the MF, MR1, and this is the long dendritic spine. It's decreased density, and you can see that a person who has Fragile X looks different from the one on the bottom who does not have Fragile X. And again, if you can kind of go back to that fuse box, you can see what we were talking about. We have all of these sorts of high neurotransmitter activations through this this really difficult dendritic spine, and it's not pruning properly like it did below. And so again, that sort of gives you a visual of what these individuals are dealing with on a daily basis. This really tells us where those areas of the brain are affected. And it's important because not only is this important for learning, but it's also important for some of what goes on with behavior. So you can see where the, this overabundance of neural connections are, are in the brain. And if we look at this next slide, it sort of breaks it down to let you know that when you look at that amygdala, which again is right up here where you can see right here, when you look at that amygdala, it really is strengthened to the extent that the anxiety in these individuals is, is certainly increased and causes some major issues for them. The weakened cortex and hippocampus, which is again up here, you can see here and the cortex, that's weakened. So it's strengthened the amygdala, amygdala but the weakened cortex and hippocampus is, is weakened and that causes short-term memory and attentional control. That's not just related to learning, by the way. Some of us have looked at some of our strategies with these individuals, and we've understood that oftentimes there's such a lack of attentional control that we really can't uh, make anything work for them in terms of our, our intervention. And so we really have to keep that in mind when we develop those interventions. And then the, the frontal lobe is weakened that causes the hyperactivity in these individuals and lack of executive functioning, which is so important for them in terms of taking on a method or a creation of a handicapping condition for sure, that they are taking that on and having trouble executing any kind of a strategy that might work for them. So again, we have to really remember this all starts with that gene so we know that these individuals are great, aren't they? They're certainly fun to be with. They have such a good side that you keep giving them extra chances, I think, at least I do, because I enjoy them so much. And they, they present with these endearing features and personality qualities that just hook us. They, it really just brings us in to such a wonderful relationship with them. And yet there are times where they really can be very frustrating and they can, they can really develop some difficult behaviors. This happens to be a family member and I think you can really enjoy the inter interaction with me and him. My birthday and I 
21st birthday, and I, and I used to love pocket watches. Could I see the front of that, oh, Tim, so I can get it on the... Oh. Kind of just so I can get it. I'm going to do a close-up, so <laughs> when you get ready, let me know. I'm sorry, much. I mean... <laughs> All right, I'm going close. Much, much, oh, it's... yes. This is exactly what I want. Perfect. So on this watch, it says... It's my birthday, and it's born 1970, 1979. I, I used to love antique pocket watches, and I, and I, I, I used to love old and cars. It's a surprise. It's a surprise. Part. And it goes with your old... Cars. My old cars. That's right, because you have a hobby with cars, don't you? Yes, I about do. It? I uh, have an 1810 Buick, and the other one's a 1910 EML, and the other one's a 1910 Hotmobile, and I, I used to do car shows, and I used to win a lot of awards. Wow. One's a Lion Award, and one's a PY Buick, and I, the one from Cranbrook. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Now, do you guys go on car tours Tell and stuff? Tell me. I, uh, yes, I, uh, I do, I'm doing a tour in Ohio, uh, oh. if, if, if Long Apples and Hills, if you, if you want to come. Oh, we could come? Sure, I could meet some pictures wow. of all cars, meet some of my friends. And we do 100 miles a day. 100 miles a day. Wow. This is so awesome. And I do antique cars for, for like 30, like 30 years. Now we've done for about 15. 15 years. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you help fix them? I fix them. So this is a hobby. Yes. And I, who have you learned from? From my father. I'm going to stop that just for a moment because I think you've gotten the gist of this. This individual is a lot of fun. It's hard to believe that he at one time threw a camera at me. We've been through the trenches together with some behavioral issues, but there are lots of good times that I remember and more good than bad with this guy. It's really fun to watch this video because you can see that he's really interested in having that conversation, even though it's very hard for him. You notice that he looks away oftentimes. He asks his mom to answer the question. That's a typical, you know, tell him so-and-so, tell him so-and-so, a typical response from these individuals. But yet there's so much about him and his joy of sharing this experience that really does make him a viable social partner. We know that there are commonalities in these challenges with individuals with Fragile X syndrome, but there's differences in the intensity and frequency and duration. And that's what we mean about the spectrum. So even though your child or the person that you're caring for has certain behaviors that have been identified by other individuals, it's that intensity and it's that frequency that makes it different for you than other people. And so again, it's a spectrum. It happens in a, in a different intensity and frequency all the time. And that is really difficult to deal with. What we do know is that the, the environmental conditions and also medical conditions certainly affect that intensity and frequency and duration. So the behavior problems worsen if they're reinforced in a variety of ways, and we don't even know what they are. What, what I mean by that is there are times where we're thinking we're helping set up a really calm environment or a supportive environment, and yet basically what we're doing is we're working against that individual with Fragile X. So it's really important for us to look at those behavioral concerns on an individualized basis. In other words, we can't design a cookbook today and say to you, when your child hits you, this is what you do. It's, it's really based on individual basis and we have to look at the environment, we have to look at the effectiveness, we have to look at the age. There are a number of things that we need to do in order to really provide a good sound behavioral program. I think something that comes up often is the anxiety piece. And I have many parents talk to me about that. And I had a, a parent the other day who said, you know, I wonder if my son feels loved because he's so anxious and he sort of hides away and doesn't come out of his room and it's so difficult for him to have any interaction with us. So I'm wondering if all of a sudden he thinks I don't love him. And again, you know, I was quick to say, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, he loves you and he wants to be within earshot or even be able to see you. So that tells you that he wants to be with you. It's just that there's something getting in the way of that and that's anxiety. Anxiety. I want to show you this clip because this guy really shows us what kind of what anxiety looks like and how intervention is so difficult for him. Let's take a look at this and, and watch. Now we're going to try something really fun. You're sitting down and your chair is up to the table. 
and up to the table. So it's on the boss. Hands are down, hands are down. We're working for this giraffe. Good. So it's easy to get dysregulated here when we switch gears. Oh, we have to work with this. Sit down, please. Oh, look at this. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? It hurts. Sit down. Well, you need to sit down. It won't hurt. Why not? Why not? Why not? Here's the chair. Why not? Why not? And we're going to work. Boss. Might stand in front of that. That's what it is. So you can see here that even the expert <laughs> sometimes doesn't do exactly the right thing to keep a child engaged. This individual, I did all kinds of things, hoping that it was going to work. And we did better later on in the interview and in the session. But I had a lot of high interest materials, as you saw me trying to re-engage him to override that anxiety. But you can clearly see that even with a lot of those environmental supports, high interest and those kinds of things, we really needed to focus in on some baby steps related to him attending and being engaged with me. You could see the anxiety in him. And really all he was thinking about, even though he really wanted to attend to what I had created and it was high interest, all he could think about is getting out of that room and, and going somewhere else. So again, it really interferes. It overrides everything that they really want to do. So it's a big factor. This one is so interesting because this little guy is in a school and we know that what happens with social interaction is that that social anxiety really does cause that individual to be aloof and withdrawn. And again, here's, here's a, an indication of that in the school. So the guy with fragile X is behind the door and these little girls just really want to play with him. And he's so socially anxious that he just can't, it, it's that approach avoidance. He wants to come out, but he can't. And again, some people would read that as he just doesn't want to do anything with anybody. I read it as it's so overwhelming for him to be with others, but he wants to very, very much. So again, they're trying to talk to him and he's trying to participate, but it's really difficult for him. Now, this is another thing that we consider that's part of the behavioral challenge, and that's the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. And some people will say to me, well, my child does not have hyperactivity, so why do you call it ADHD? It's, it should be ADD. Well, the, the, the medical term and what we use in our diagnostic manual includes that hyperactivity disorder. We break it down into different components. So if your child is not hyper, then there is one for just inattentiveness or there is one for just impulsiveness. So again, just to kind of explain that. This individual is in a school and you're going to see he's really excited about leading this activity, but it's very hard for him because we know that when we put them up on stage, sometimes it's tough. So watch while he goes through, sort of leading this group on what we call a morning meeting. We are listening to Today. Yesterday was Monday. Tomorrow is Wednesday. Tomorrow will be Wednesday. <laughs> okay, so you can tell there are a couple of things going on. We will talk about hyperarousal in a minute, which is what that sort of looks like. And I have a lot of people asking me, what's the difference between hyperactivity and hyperarousal? And you can see in this case, not much. I think he, he is very, he's moving. He looks to be very excited because he's enjoying what he's doing. That's kind of a special thing that he's doing for the day. But again, you can see the movement. You can see the challenges related to him jumping around and, and doing whatever it takes to get through that meeting. Now, that's fine for this meeting, but what if we're trying to teach him to read? Or what if we're trying to teach him to cross the street and pay attention to something that could be harmful? And he's getting so aroused or hyper, then we're not going to be successful by just sort of teaching him in a traditional way how to do that. And that's my point about designing good, good treatment that uh, takes into account these issues. So if, if there are attention and hyperactivity issues, you can, you can know what they look like. I mean, you all know that the very short attention span and 
One of the things that's kind of interesting is this next box, paying attention to irrelevant information. Yeah. And people will say to me, well, he can't be hyper because he can pay attention to a YouTube video uh, with elevators going up and down for hours. Well, of course, that's a preferred. And he's very, very intent on watching that. But if you break that and you come up with something else that you need him to do instead of that, and you try to transition him from something that he enjoys to something that he doesn't enjoy, that's when we're gonna have some issues. So again, uh, we have to really take into account some of, some of these issues for sure, that overactivity, the sitting still, and really recalling the whole chain of events because he's been disrupted in his attention while he's watching the activity. This individual, again, I wanna talk just briefly about the fact that some of individuals with Fragile X syndrome also meet the diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder, and this one does. And so again, I wanna show this to you because he's nonverbal, and we talked about the range of behaviors that people that are more you know, affected by the gene and what goes on there are, are definitely more impacted. And we just see that in terms of the spectrum. This individual is nonverbal, and you can see what's going on with him. He's having a lot of trouble in this, in this setting. So let's go forward and, and see what, what it looks like. So let me give you a little context here. So this individual was moved over, as we had just talked about, when you go from something preferred to then some work, and he's doing some sorting there. He's very angry about that. And again, there's a lot going on here in terms of him biting himself at times, kicking, doing those sorts of things. He can become very aggressive. So that is part of this schema. This is part of that spectrum where when you do have an individual that meets the criteria for autism spectrum, there's also more involvement and more behavioral layers to deal with. This little guy kind of looking at the arousal and hyperarousal, I think it's really interesting to see how he participates or doesn't participate in this activity. When you look at it, and those of you who are caregivers and, and teachers know, and parents, you're really experts on this. You know what we can, we can introduce in an environment that's going to set these guys off. Not that we do it on purpose, but sometimes it just happens. And in this case, I think it's the perfect storm. This little guy is, is just really overwhelmed with, number one, he's in the middle, which is not a good place for him to be because if he could do a poltergeist and turn his head completely all the way around, he would because it's so difficult for him to sit there and to watch what's going on. So he wants to see what's going on and there's music, and it's loud, and they're standing, and he's sitting, and it's really, really tough for him. So let's stop that there. I mean, it's pretty obvious. If we're trying to teach him something in that environment, even if it's just the gestures to the hokey pokey, there, there's not a chance because what's he spending most of his energy doing at this point? He's really kind of just protecting himself. He's getting so much input that there's no learning that could take place in this situation, no learning of new behavioral patterns for sure, because he's using his energy just to protect himself against all those things that are in that environment. So again, just looking at this and really paying attention to what we see when we've overloaded them with all this incoming information. Now we know that these individuals actually do have panic attacks. And when we see them being sort of overstimulated or becoming very hyper aroused, we can literally see the physical features of that. So this again drives the point home that this is not something that's just a straight behavior because he wants something at this point so he's gonna act out. It really does go into the neurobiology. So when you look at this individual, you will see him getting flush and going through a panic attack. 
he he gets very flushed his ears his cheeks you can see even just right now before we run the video and i think a lot of times i'll see them rubbing their palms of their hands or rubbing it against their legs just to kind of dry off their hands because they're sweating more at that point. They're very disorganized when they go through this. Sometimes they get, their speech gets very cluttered and very re repetitive. So again, let's take a look. I'll get you water, honey. It's okay. 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 You're okay. okay. You wish that so. you felt more relaxed, don't you, honey? Okay. So, so Tracy's trying to give him some deep breathing, helping with deep breathing, trying to help him get through this situation. He just overloaded while we were working with him and uh, he can hardly breathe. You can tell that's what he's saying and he needs a drink of water. So again, that's a tough one to watch, but it's so important for us to remember that this is real. This is definitely related to that neurobiology. And so when they get anxious and over anxious and they become so hyper aroused, there's nothing that you can do but to get them calmed down at that point. This little guy does a lot of biting and trying to escape through biting. And I'll talk to you in part, in the second part of this lecture, about what we can do about those behaviors that become habituated. He really has learned that biting upsets everybody around him. And so he does that really to sort of refuse or to stop engaging in a, in a learning activity. And so in this case, we were having him do something what you know the behavioral experts call a DRO, which you're, you're really competing with the behavior of biting. And so if you're handing him things to pick up and he needs his hands to pick them up, he can't bite anymore. So that's kind of what we're, we're doing here. But these individuals do avoid and they escape because they don't want to engage in, in a certain activity or to change their behavior to comply to something that we're asking them to do. This is an avoidance of a transition. And you can see how difficult this is. So he's, he's come out of the classroom and he's waiting for the school bus and he drops to the ground. And I'm sure there's many in the audience right now that say, yeah, I'm familiar with that. So dropping to the ground is difficult. He's in an area where he could, he could be, you know, there could be some dangers there. So they're trying to hold him down, trying to keep him from kicking. And all of that attention is overwhelming. And yet we're in a situation where they've got to do it to keep him safe. They're trying to distract him. But as you can see, there's really too much going on. And I think that's an important part of this video, that while we're trying to sort of help this individual and support this individual, if we're giving them more and more input, we're really hurting them in the, in the process because they're not going to be able to listen to our instruction or any changes that we want them to make in their behavior. This is an example of, of avoidance and escape. This is in a transition again. And again, we've got that as one of the triggers we'll talk about in just a minute. Transitions are extremely difficult and they set the stage for lots of difficult behaviors to ensue. This individual is coming to school, that's mom, and you can see that he's very angry and the transition is extremely difficult for him. So I want to make a comment here that I think is kind of interesting. What the mom is doing, we set up some sort of breaking the behavior chain, which again is in this lecture. It's, it's interesting because he's so used to doing things a certain way. He has a tantrum. Mom has, and we've worked out the possibility of him earning in the days when we had DVDs. And that's what she was trying to do is get the attention from the teacher. Do you notice that he stops yelling at that point and he wants to hear what she's saying? So you see, there's ways to break that chain. There's ways to get him engaged in something different than avoidance and being aggressive. So again, that, that's just a real important thing to observe. One of the things that happens, and it, it's very sad, is I've seen over the years a number of the individuals becoming older and sometimes actually withdraw socially more than ever. They stay in their bedroom more. They might not come out of the house. They become very reclusive. 
and and that's a big problem. And again, if they're going to participate in the community and what's going on in that environment, they have to be able to leave their house and they have to be able to engage. So one of the things I think that happens, this happens sometimes later on after they've been through high school or, or trade school, there's so much structure and predictability in those environments and when they're going to school, that sort of keeps them engaged and it, it really lessens their anxiety because they know what's happening every day. And then when they get into a system where either there's nothing in the community for them to do because of funding or there, there's it's very different. They may work three days a week or instead of going to school five days a week. That lack of structure and predictability sometimes I think really does cause them to become more reclusive. They're great, aren't they? They just they have so many fun skills. And this is an individual who was dressing up and, and was really having a good time being Sherlock Holmes. It was, it was just, just great. And that good sense of humor just gets us going. That's sort of that endearing quality that we talked about when Tim was being interviewed about his stopwatch. They love talking about things of interest. They look forward to routines. And a lot of times after they get engaged in things like bowling and swimming or other social clubs, they are really good about their attendance and enjoying it. So they do like to spend time with us and our families and people that are familiar with them. That's so many good social skills and strengths for them that, that we like to try to, to build on that. The challenges, however, are the anxiety and shyness. They sometimes avoid groups, especially if it's brand new. They don't want to, to make eye contact. And again, that's something we discourage. Please don't. Don't force that because you're just going to, to engage them in some maladaptive behaviors because that's so hard for them. They have a poor social understanding at times. And so again, not understanding what's going on in, in a social setting, like if somebody's raising their voice because they want to drive a point across, they're going to perceive that as someone yelling as a conflict, which they do not like at all. And they don't always know how to negotiate out of a difficult situation with peers or coworkers. This is an in interesting clip about executive functioning. And again, those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it's, it's real big in the literature and all literature, not just for individuals with fragile X. There's a lot that's being talked about with people with learning disabilities. What it is, is it's formulating a plan and executing it. And it's, it's really an interesting thing to watch. This individual you'll see as we're getting through this group, trying to get started to execute, to talk about something is very difficult. And he will go all around the subject or try to avoid starting by having somebody else start or whatever. You'll, you'll see it right away. And I know you're familiar with this. You were able to get the subject area that we're gonna start talking about. And what was it? Oh, sorry. I didn't, I'm not here. Sorry. So he's what making, kind of making excuses. What did you draw? Sports. Okay, so you're going to start the conversation about sports. And then, Alex, you're going to ask a question about sports. Okay. And you're going to make a comment about okay. sports. Okay, so start talking. Can you go first? No, you go See, first. See, that's the hard part. Think, think of it as a uh, sports thing that you want to talk mm -hmm. about. There's one that's really important that just happened, so go for it. Mm -hmm. The biggie. I watched. I hope you did. Oh, yeah. Super go. Bowl. Okay, so tell the whole thing. I watched. Super Bowl. Chiefs won. Okay. Question to him about the Super Bowl. Okay, then he. Him. So you can see how hard it was to start that conversation. And typically he'll always say, somebody else can start or you start, or he might give me one word to sort of just tease me into, you know, forgiving him and saying, okay, it's somebody else's turn getting off the hot seat, but it's really hard for him to execute. We see it with little kids when we want them to, to write something or to do something, they may turn their pencil over and over, just sort of trying to figure out a way to delay that start because they don't know how to start. That's that executive functioning issue that we see. And then a lot of times we have sensory processing, and that is really difficult because they can't process that, that sensory information that's coming in from their environment. And at that point, we really lose them because they're very hypersensitive to sounds and to touch and smells, all kinds of, and, and visuals. 
And so again, that causes them to have behavioral outbursts. And we know that with individuals like this, it's really very difficult for them to attend at that point. You can see this little guy is just miserable. We figured out that the, the lights were really difficult for him at this hotel. There are a lot of things going on that he's just saying, I want out because the sensory overload is just too much. So again, we also talk about mood lability. And sometimes with this population, you'll hear this related to, well, we're, we're going to talk about medication and we need to deal with that mood lability. So there's lots of changes in their moods. And you may see them really excited about something. And then just like that, they turn and they're upset or they're having an episode or behavioral outburst. There, there were sometimes not very many signals that go on ahead of that change. And a lot of times very frightened by that themselves because processing those feelings that go with that mood change is very difficult for them and it scares them because they don't understand it either. We don't understand it and they don't understand it. So they don't label them clearly. They don't give us that information. They misread cues that are coming in at that point. And even if we're trying to help them, they're so hyper aroused in that lib lability the mood lability is changing so much that they just can't stabilize and regulate. And so then we get into a, a severe tantrum. And I might add that when your child or the person that you're caring for, and even an adult, does have an episode of a severe tantrum, it's really important for you to make sure that they're safe and you're safe. It's not the time at that point to implement any strategy to try to fix things at that point, because it's already spilled over the top. And what's gonna happen is somebody's gonna get hurt. So again, my, my strong recommendation is that when there is a tantrum, please make sure that the individual with Fragile X is safe and that you're safe or anyone else that's around is, is safe. What's perseveration? A lot of people wanna know about that. It happens a lot, doesn't it? It's words and thoughts that kind of gets stuck in that brain and they don't move forward. It, it usually has an anxiety component because once they're getting pretty anxious, that's when they start to repeat a lot of things because I think at that point, their brain really kind of goes blank and they're not really doing a lot of processing. They really need that same routine oftentimes and that can become perseverative. They may have to do something like, you know, rearrange something on their desk before they can start. They may need to be able to do something in the room before they can engage in an activity. Also, there's kind of that autistic-like behavior that goes on with some perseveration, like the hand biting and the flapping and the jumping and the pacing. A lot of our, our guys do that. When they become sort of over-aroused, they perseverate on those things. I mostly think of it as words being stuck on something and being and saying the thing over and over again. Uh, the function, and that's the part that's so important here, because that's what we're getting, this sort of leads us into part two of this lecture. We really want to look at the behavior, and that's fine, and we do spend a heck of a lot of time looking at behavior, don't we, and worrying about why is he doing it. We really need to roll it back and say, what's the function? Because nobody does anything without it being purposeful or getting them something, right? So when a kid just points, uh, 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 they're going to get something from the shelf. You're going to get it down and give it to them. There's a function be behind that pointing. There's a function behind them biting their hand until they get what they want. So the function is, what purpose does it solve? Well, I think it holds a space. It gives them time to think. They, they kind of can perseverate and say the thing over and over again. Sometimes it gives them a chance to emphasize something more. I see this in the girls a lot, in the females, that when they're really upset or they're trying to tell me a story of something that bothered them, they will say that same, and then he did this, and then he did, and then he did this, and then he did, and then he did. So it's that perseverative over and over, kind of to make a point and emphasize part of the conversation. It also provides a way to secure that routine because they're going to be needing to repeat over and over again a, a routine and keep sameness in place. In, our, in other words, when things are the same, it really is calming. And anybody who kind of has that OCD characteristic, if you can get things in place or you can do things a certain way, you can calm down and then move forward with, with, with some other activity. 
it's really part of a calming mechanism then, isn't it? To be able to repeat that over and over again. And sometimes that's what it's about. Sometimes they actually do perseverate just to calm themselves down. Now it's not adaptive by any means, but it's something that they've come up with to calm themselves down. And sometimes it's simply kind of a crude or immature way to communicate. So they may give you a part of what happened and they perseverate over and over on that particular part. It's not sequenced so that it gives you any clear indication of, of what they're really talking about. So this ends part one. We've gone through a lot of the foundational work that we need to have in place to understand how to develop a sound behavior intervention plan. And we will take questions at this point. Such an enriching presentation. Can't thank you enough. You're, you're welcome. You've, you've given some lovely practical strat strategies and ideas, as always. And just love how you talk about the, you know, the joy and the strengths that these individuals bring to our lives as well, which is, 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 is so important. And just to sort of jump onto your analogy as there's not a cookbook response to anything. There's no cookie cutter, a cookie cutter there approach. There was, is there? No, no, no. no. <laughs> And we learn as we go, don't we, as well? Like we think, do, yeah. we do. Yeah. So thank your boys you. have taught me and your men and your girls have taught me so much. And, uh, and that's, that's just so meaningful for me because that makes me feel better about, you know, opportunities that I have to share those, those, that information with you. So thank you so much. And thank you for being brave and, and being great parents and caregivers. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you. And we should also, if you could, forward at any stage a pass thank you to the families who've allowed their children to be part of those videos as right. well which it, is, yes um, indeed yeah please please do forward that on to the families and, and 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 thank you to everyone who's joined today it's a beautiful sunny day here in sydney I hope it's sunny where you are and as i mentioned before we're lucky in that this is a part of a two-part series so a reminder that marsha marsha will be presenting a part two of this webinar series on understanding behaviors and fragile x syndrome on the 12th of november and in her final webinar as part of this series for 2022, that is, Marsha will outline practical strategies to support lifelong learning for children and adults who have fragile X syndrome in a range of settings, including school, vocational settings, community settings and workplaces on the 10th of December. And once again, a very big thank you to everyone who's joined and hopefully Marsha you can see those thank yous popping up I'm seeing well them you yes wonderful thank you everyone and uh, and thank you again to Zynerva Pharmaceuticals for the educational grants and making this three-part series of webinars with Marsha possible